Okay, so this is the continuation of the evil seeds that produce the evil tree. And there are a bunch of them, in, and we'll have to touch some of those, especially, you know, the Judaizers and the Gnostics and stuff like that. But we're looking at the seven letters to the seven churches right now because it's a great outline of kind of what happened to change the shape of Christianity. Um, so last time we talked... Uh, or I talked <laughs> at some length about um, the clergy lady system that was put in place over now that happened over time you see the seeds of it in the New Testament in Corinthians Paul talked about these false apostles who would follow the true apostles around and visit the churches that they planted and they were uh, if you put it all together they were basically Judaizers I think to put people under the law and they refused to work <laughs> because um, they felt like they should be paid and you know Paul did say that the uh, were the workers worthy of his hire and stuff and and yet for the carnal churches like Corinth he refused to take their money but worked with his hands among them so that the gospel would be free of charge to them. And this was, he put this as a sharp contrast to the false apostles who demanded that they be taken care of by the churches and wouldn't work. And he said they were busybodies in other people's affairs. They walked disorderly. And uh, the so he, he says, you know, watch out for these guys. And if you realize, if you look at these different passages, he's not just talking about regular rank-and-file sheep, although he encouraged everybody to work with their hands so that they may have to give to people, not to take care of their own needs. That It's interesting. The New Testament, really the Father takes care of our needs. If we have that kind of vision, then when we work, our money is just passing through our hands for other people. <laughs> That's really the New Testament picture. And, you know, do we live like that? Not perfectly or not necessarily or not at all. <laughs> to varying degrees. And that's according to your faith. And faith is apportioned uh, by God. Not all have the same kind of faith or that kind of even giving faith. So you can't make a law out of that. Um, but these guys were... A problem in the churches and being busybodies in other people's affairs they were always in people's houses and they were always talking and a lot of the things they were saying was undermining the faith of the believers and they were gifted at rhetoric Paul in contrast said look you know when I'm with you I'm in meekness and fear and much trembling and I don't work with a display of earthly wisdom or power because I want your faith to be not in the wisdom and power of men, but in the power of God. So he said, you know, you guys say that Paul's appearance is contemptible and his speech is contemptible, but his letters are very weighty. And that is Paul, you know, Paul, and it, I don't think that that he was, he didn't stutter or something like that. He, well, he'd been beaten everywhere he went, so he was a scarred person. He wasn't pretty to look at, I'm sure. Um, but also, he said, I bear my, bo my body the marks of Jesus Christ, referring to the persecutions he'd been through. He'd been beaten and shipwrecked and everywhere he went there was a riot the, that and i happen to believe that that was the thorn of, in his flesh the messenger from satan sent to buffet him was literal so that everywhere he went when he preached the gospel the the crowds would he'd be he was stoned to death i mean god and god had to raise him every time so even in second corinthians he talks about how we despaired even of life itself and had the sentence of death in ourselves so that our faith would rest in the power of God who raises us from the dead. And so he was literally living day by day by resurrection in a way that we can't really understand. And God used the buffeting of Satan and his messenger 
the thorn in Paul's flesh, and the riots around him to always press him to his knees. Now he, when he spoke to the churches when he was in their midst, he said we were gentle as a nursing mother. So we were affectionately desirous of you and we were so tender and so humble among you that you guys have now said we're contemptible and you are impressed with our letters which are weighty. But these false apostles were great orators and they spoke great swelling words of vanity and they uh, boasted in their flesh and they boasted in their Judaic history and they demanded that the saints take care of them and they were busybodies in the saints affairs and they laid burdens on the saints and Paul said look you'd even put up with these people if they were to slap you in the face that's what it says in uh, first Corinthians you know so that's the seeds of this Nicolaitan system, the clergy lady system, but still at that time the meetings were still such that they met in mutuality and when they came together each one had and was encouraged to prophesy. Now the way to silence the loud speaking vainglorious false apostles is not to tell them to shut up but to speak. To have every member speaking will put them, especially if they're actually speaking by the anointing and speaking properly as sheep should, their healthy teaching will be a sharp contrast to the false teaching of the false apostles and then those with discernment will discern. So um, when you have an environment where everybody can speak, it can balance out some of this stuff. And it was still kind of like that in 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 the early church where the apostles were still alive and writing. Now we see Diotrephes I mentioned um, in 3rd John how he began to have the preeminence you know. So we do see this um, now and we also see the apostolic warnings especially like Peter warn um, that there are these people among you and he mentions in 2nd uh, Peter 2.15 he says uh, these false prophets false teachers and man he has he, he really has some terrible things to say about them <laughs> their spots and blemish sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin and they beguile unstable souls and they have a heart exercised with covetous practices they're cursed children and for 2.15 they've forsaken the right way and are gone astray following the way of Balaam the son of Bozor who loved the wages of unrighteousness okay so and then he says we'll, we'll come back to that so he mentions Balaam and Jude also mentions Balaam and that's really important because in the next development of this clergy lady system that you see in the letters to the seven churches Balaam is referenced so Going back to Ephesus, remember, there was the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which Jesus said he hate. And Nicolaitans means the, the, the uh, conquer, to conquer the, the laity. And it's this idea that there's a group that will usurp the laity, the priesthood of all believers, and take it upon themselves to rule, to conquer the laity. Okay? Now, like I said, we see the seeds in the New Testament. But this really wasn't developed full blown till a little later. During the time, so there's there's the Church of Ephesus and its letter, and then there's the Church of Smyrna and its letter. And in that letter, God has nothing negative to say to the Church of Smyrna. He says they'll suffer persecution for ten days, and if they uh, endure, some of them will be put in jail and put to death, and they will endure and receive the crown of life. Well, that speaks of the next period of church history, which was characterized by persecution from the Romans under ten successive emperors. And they uh, were living in hideouts and meeting in caves and gone underground, pushed underground. And they were being persecuted in the Colosseums. We kind of know that history. But the meetings were still healthy. And see the thing is is when you have everybody functioning and the body is being built up 
in each local church, then you've got many capable speakers um, who can preach the gospel and preach the truth. So even if you take the leaders out, it doesn't matter because God's got another person who's equipped to stand in their place. And you see that even in Acts where Paul, uh, uh, the apostles, sorry, not Paul, um, he hadn't come on the scene yet, but the apostles were were needing to spend their more time on the word and there was the problem of the Greeks and the widows who needed food they weren't being taken care of so they appointed these deacons and Stephen was one of them and the deacons and Philip and and the deacons were to uh, take care of the tables basically but it's interesting because those deacons were able to function and they got right into preaching the gospel and and while they're waiting tables and stuff they are defending the faith apostolically and some of the greatest preaching came from them you know and god did miracles through their hands and they did uh you know works to confirm the gospel and they defended the gospel very clearly and prophetically just as well as peter and those guys which shows that God is not limited to a leadership. He wants to function through the body. And uh, so that's how it was in the New Testament and in that early period of church history where the persecution pushed the church underground. Now, I believe that the false prophets, the false believers, were shaken out during that time and would have not associated themselves so much with the persecuted. I mean, there were still some, but... um, that kind of purified things a little bit and they say that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church and this the church grew because you've got all these functioning members during that time now then in the third century and this is just a high level overview i mean somebody could do a better job but um a more thorough job uh in the third century what happens is constantine has that vision of the cross that he says is uh, the way he waged the war and he was to fight in that in the name of the cross and he um, conquered in the name of Christ and had some kind of conversion now whether he was a genuine believer is hard to know Uh, there's evidence that he was not but the main thing though is that the Christian church was able to come under out of hiding because he quit the persecutions and not only that but he sanctioned the christian church and made it sort of like the official religion of the day okay so now you have a situation that's completely new where the church has a situation where they're in political favor and that's a dangerous thing actually because that's when the true believers really suffer at the hands of their brothers um but so you have this period where um and now that is getting into the third letter to the seven churches which is the letter to the church at pergamus and pergamus means mixed marriage i believe and it that refers to the marriage of the church to the world and here we have two things mentioned when he talks about their condemnation remember ephesus had the condemnation that they lost their first love but the commendation was you at least you've tried the false apostles and you hate the deeds of the nicolaitans and i hate that too well now you see the deeds of the nicolaitans referred to again in pergamus the letter to the church of pergamus but instead of being the deeds of the nicolaitans He calls it the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, meaning now it's becoming an official teaching. And it's put right on the heels of a verse about Balaam. So I'm going to read that for you in Revelation 2, 14 and 15. He says, But I have a few things against you, because you have there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit fornication so also you have them that hold the doctrine of the nicolaitans which thing i also hate okay so number one the teaching are the deeds of the nicolaitans which we see in the early church these bullies has now become an official teaching it's an official doctrine to conquer the laity and it's grouped with this 
idea of Balaam. Now, if you go back to Numbers, Balaam is an interesting character because he was a prophet, but he wasn't from the tribes of Israel. He was an outsider, and he hated, he was an enemy of the children of Israel. And he was hired by a king named Balak, who wanted to defeat, he couldn't defeat them in battle. So he wanted this prophet to stand and prophesy curses against Israel. And he was going to give him money to do it. Because he thought that these words would have power, that would like a witchcraft kind of thing. And these, he, could, he could curse Israel and supernaturally they'd be defeated. Well, God actually showed up to Balaam and wouldn't let him do it. And Balaam has an interesting thing because it seems like he's a genuine... God spoke through him as if he was a genuine prophet. And yet, his agenda is gross. He's interested in money and he'll work for hire for God's enemies, for the enemies of God's people. And... Uh, you know, God shows up and he will not let Balaam curse Israel. So Balaam keeps going around the camp of Israel in, in, in uh, the wilderness. And Balaam keeps saying, okay, now prophesy from here. Maybe you'll see something different. Each time he prophesies, he prophesies something wonderful about the destiny of Israel and some of the most profound prophecies in the Old Testament about the future reign of the scepter that's to come out of uh, Judah and uh, the king that will come forth from Jacob, speaking of Christ, and how he'll judge the nations. That's Balaam's prophecies. And these are genuine prophecies because, and, and don't think something special about Balaam because God rebuked Balaam through a donkey. So God showed, look, you know, you, you may think, you're the genuine prophet because I'm speaking through you in these moments, but all I'm doing is protecting my people. I will not let you curse them. And I can speak through a donkey, which he did. Um, so that's the root of Balaam, the story. Now, when he could not, by cursing, bring defeat to Israel, he taught Balak. Here's how Jesus puts it. He taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and commit fornication. So the story in the Old Testament is Balaam said, okay, I can't curse them, but here's what you do. If you can get them to chase after other gods, you will weaken their position before their God and you can bring them under judgment. And if they're under judgment, then God is against them and not for them. And then you can defeat them. So he taught Balak to hold these feasts where the beautiful women from the nations surrounding uh, Israel invited all the Israelites out of the wilderness to come and have these feasts. And they seduced them sexually. And while they did that, they introduced them to Baal worship and, out, and idol worship. Okay? Well, that cause that was a marriage in a way of Israel making their members members of these harlots you know and they're now eating things sacrificed to idols in these feasts and they've already been brought out of idolatry and and given the tabernacle and the testimony and the sacrifices and the Levitical system and the word of God they had such a highly privileged position before God they had the Shekinah glory and they were following the cloud in the wilderness and yet now they've been reduced to dancing at a rave outside in the you know Peor, Valley of Peor or whatever and, and eating things sacrificed to idols and committing fornication and it's really bad news. Now, God cleans the situation up, but this is a pattern. And when Jesus is referring to this, he wants you to have that in mind. So Jesus is telling the church in Pergamos, I have this against you because you have them that hold the doctrine. It's become an official teaching of Balaam. Okay. Who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. So now, Balaam 
we already mentioned in Second Peter um, that he, and we mentioned in the Old Testament, he was willing to speak for God, right? But for hire by God's enemies. Now, uh, let's go back to what Peter said about these guys. Because this is really when the clergy laity system became official, if you will. Okay. Second Peter 2.15, again. Um, or 2.10, let's try here. Let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. 2.13. Where did it? Okay. 2.15, all right. He's talking about these false prophets. And he says, They've forsaken the right thing and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosar, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity, the dumb ass, speaking with a man's voice, forbade the madness of the prophet. So these are people who are willing to speak for the Lord, yes. And, and while they're in that position, they cannot curse outright openly they can't curse god's people the people in, in in the old testament god just stopped them from doing it but in the new testament the sheep would know okay this is our enemy if he's just outright cursing us so he's more subtle but you gotta understand balaam hates god's people and these people these false prophets this class of people hate god's people and they are willing to work for a wage not supported by the saints but hired by god's enemies okay that's the wages of unrighteousness and well in when constantine made the church the official state religion he they started doing this thing this is where you start to see the catholic church emerge but they took the they decided to christianize the pagans forcing baptism on people but uh so the idea was to have a unified church a unified state religion for the sake of unity and peace in the empire because the persecutions was not a restful situation at all you know and all this religious contention was a problem to have peace and unity and pax romana and all that so they um what they did was they took the pagan feasts and renamed the characters and the practices in the pagan feasts so that they would have Christian names and Christian designations so the pagans could continue to keep their traditions and yet they would just be called Christian things and the Christians then were brought into practice of pagan idolatrous religious rituals but thinking they're worshiping Christ so it's a really interesting mix where you've got all the people doing the same thing and they all think it's Christian in name but the pagans are able to still worship their demons through these practices and now the Christians are being brought into contact with these things and God calls that a kind of fornication because he's married to his chaste bride and these um, teachers are teaching them to participate in these you know ungodly religious practices which are really now you know most of our traditions from Catholicism are all tied up in these practices and these feasts so okay now don't be a legalist Okay, if you have a conscience that says don't celebrate Christmas, fine. If you have a conscience that says, but if you're just using that as an excuse to not buy Christmas presents for your family and you're just being selfish, then, you know, it may be hiding a deeper motive. Now, that's what I used to do. I'd be like, well, no, that's Babylonian and I'm not participating. And it really, the deep motive God showed me was I just didn't have a generous heart towards my family and I didn't want to buy Christmas presents. Now, God is not as offended by these things as you think. He is if you're fellowshipping with demons and that's where really we draw the line you know paul even encouraged people to go when they were invited to feasts because you don't know when you're going to get to preach the gospel and we have liberty as christians to practice uh to use the elements of the world 
for the furtherance of the gospel. And we don't get in bondage about feast days and stuff. But he did say, I don't want you participating in fellowship with demons. And if you have a weak conscience and this is going to bother you, then you need to abstain. But also, if somebody tells you, hey, this meat, by the way, at this feast has been sacrificed to an idol, then I don't want you to eat it, he said. And it wasn't for their sake. It wasn't that... It, <laughs> It wasn't for their sake. It was for the con sake of the conscience of the people who thought, hey, this is something demonic. The power of that stuff has been broken off us. We are not of this world, and we are not subject to demonic powers. They can't get to you. you know. Some, uh, they can't get to you the way we kind of superstitiously think. They get to you when you believe false doctrine. That's how demons come in and damaged Christians not through some of the other ways but if you open yourself up to them they can get to you or if you just believe a leavened truth a leavened gospel the de demon can come in can, and oppress you th until that truth is cleared up so a lot of people are under all kinds of demonic oppression and it's because they're not clear about the gospel and they're not clear about the truth in certain areas I was under oppression for a long time because I believed in um, incorrect authority in the church and put way too much authority on the pastor and believed he was like the equivalent of Moses and whatever he said even if he was wrong I had to obey that was a way that the enemy could come in and damage me damage my conscience and then just oppress me I was under legitimate oppression demonic oppression for years until I got clear about how New Testament authority works which is very different once I got clear about that, that oppression was never able to come back. So our freedom from demons is through understanding of the truth, not abstaining from meats or abstaining from this or that. Now, I don't, I'm not saying let's go out and go to the raves and go to the bars and do whatever we want. No, what I'm saying is don't get so hung up about Christmas and Easter. You know, it is what it is. We don't have to make such a big stink about it and be an offense to people about it. I think we lose people, you know, thinking that God is jealous for things he's not. Now, in the Old Testament, it was a really big deal because it was either the Shekinah glory in the wilderness with that tabernacle or you were out in the Valley of Peor having your party and fornicating and stuff and being brought into sin and they were worshiping the demons. So it's a different deal. In the... Uh, and we can go through this later when we get to Thyatira, but Jesus said, those who don't know the depths of Satan, I'm not going to put any bur further burden on them. You know, he is not putting a weight of legalism on you about these things. So that's a tangent. But anyway, Balaam, we see when the church started doing all this stuff to establish the state religion, they took outsiders and put them over congregations and made them priests. And these guys were, in many cases, occultists, but they were nuanced in biblical doctrine, almost like the Jesuits today, who could expound on the Bible very clearly. And um, they were enemies of God's people, and they wanted to weaken God's people. So that's what the you have some that teach, have the doctrine of, Balaam, number one. But number two, they had lavish salaries and lifestyles. And I mean, now, instead of being in caves, they were taking the... They were building these big palaces of marble, basically. These are these churches in this time, these shrines. Many of them were actually temples for the pagans, but they were converted to Christian churches. And the, the leaders, these Balaamites, Balaam people these priests were given a throne they were literally sitting on these big marble thrones behind a big altar and and this is even before the roman catholic thing came into existence from what i understand and they were great orators and they spoke great swelling words of vanity and there was no longer a practice of everybody speaking it was them speaking and they had the Bible, but they were taught 
to allegorize everything related to the kingdom. So Jesus wasn't coming back to rule and overthrow the evil age, evil age and the evil kingdoms of this world. No, the emperor is uh, appointed by God, and you need to obey him. And um, the church will be here in perpetuity until we take over the earth. And that's where dominionism started to come in, was through the allegorization of the scripture through these appointed Balaamites who were the first pastors uh, that really, where the pastoral role became a position exalted far above the congregation. And they hated God's people. Now, how does this relate today? Well, today we still see the role of the pastor replacing the saints, obviously. And I've gotten to know some pastors and some are good, but there is a condescending and a smug attitude that they have towards the sheep. They don't like the sheep. And whether they know it or not, they don't like them. They think they're stupid, and they think that they don't know the Bible the way they do, and they think that the sheep, their concerns are petty, and all their messages are condescending. And they speak to them like they're children. You know, I cannot sit in a message where I'm being spoken to like a 12-year-old. And, and it's because they assume you don't know the Bible. Now, the reason you don't know the Bible is because they don't equip the saints. So they don't have a genuine ministry. They are just giving you flowery-sounding words that are leading you nowhere because their messages are devoid of Christ, mainly. Now, some of them are good, but I think it's amazing that anyone could have the audacity to become a pastor. And this is just my opinion, but, you know this idea that you're going to be set up over the flock and you're going to be a full-time busybody meddling in their affairs and giving them advice that you shouldn't be giving them about their lives that they should be hearing from the lord what you should be doing is endeavoring let's say you are a pastor okay fine you should be endeavoring to equip the saints so that they don't need you you should be equipping them to study the word and get the food themselves and hear from the lord themselves you shouldn't be going, yeah, you need to marry this person and you shouldn't be involved with that and you need to be doing that. That, that auto autocratic way of ruling has is totally ungodly. And there's no room for the body and it's one person speaking. And I'll tell you, these pastors, for the most part, are totally ignorant of the scriptures because they've come out of a seminary situation where they've been trained to speak a certain way. And that training is very shallow and superficial, number one. And number two... They haven't gone through anything in their life to form them into a real mouthpiece that can speak in the principle of incarnation. See, Balaam can speak because, and God can speak through Balaam without God having to deal with Balaam as a person because God can just take over. But what God really wants is people who have gone through some things in Christ and have suffered. And through that suffering, they've been broken in their natural strength and have learned to rely on the Lord and God's taught them so many things and comforted them through so many scriptures and truths through their different struggles that now when they speak something from Christ comes out of their person and not out of a job that they do week after week for money and the 503c thing you know having the tax exempt status and being exalted over the flock and you don't have to pay taxes and you're you know i mean it's not a good situation because you are unable to say certain things as one of these tax exempt foundations there are rules that apply to keep that status so that's one of the main reasons why you don't hear the teachings on the kingdom and the end times and the the rapture of the church and even real clear about justification a lot of that is just swallowed up in the fact that they have to keep this status and the seminaries reinforce these interpretations that will prepare these people to be pastors in tax-exempt situations where they're only allowed to say a limited set of things what they can preach on is self-improvement and uh, pop psychology and things that will let you have you know your best life now kind of thing so that, i guess it's kind of a rant but this is Pergamus, and this is the development of the pastoral system or the clergy lady system into an official teaching that's backed by the state. And it's a Balaamite way where they're willing to work for the wages of unrighteousness and 
at that time it was literally they were receiving money I think from Rome and they were having lavish living and they were they have a contempt for God's people and yet they become the orders who speak in place of God's people and they weaken God's people by bringing them into contact with the world more than into contact with the Lord and you know that's definitely true again in the na churches I, you know I don't want to be too religious but you know you go to these church picnics for example that's supposed to be an outreach to the community and they've got a DJ and he's playing you know Beyonce and all this stuff it's just a confusing mess and uh, you know the world worldly element in the church that what that does is it produces Laodicea it produces a numbness a sleepiness because the world is a drug and it's it, and when you drink of it and take it in it numbs your spiritual sense and it numbs your capacity to love the Lord and your feelings for him and your capacity to see truth all of it so it weakens you and that is a Balaamite practice to marry you with the world and get you uh, to uh, basically give up your function that's really what's being attacked and that's why the doctrine of the Nicolaitans and the doctrine of Balaam go together okay this is inspirational um i'm sure there's better more plenty more you can say about pergamon and i'm just trying to give an overview based on how i'm seeing it right now and i hope again that this is blessing anybody who was actually supposed to hear it <laughs>